Good morning and welcome to MCC Toronto. We want to welcome you this morning, whether you're attending for the first time or the hundredth time, whether you're worshiping with us in the building or online, uh, welcome to our service. Our mission is to build bridges with a vibrant spirituality that transforms lives and transforms our world. Our desire is to be a beacon for freedom and justice and faith here and around the world. So, Welcome to MCC Toronto, and if I might say, welcome home. Welcome home to this place. Um, thank you for your cards and your emails, um, your voice messages over the last few days. That, um, my mom uh, died um, a week ago Thursday, and John and I went to New Brunswick, and I presided at the funeral on Tuesday, uh, which was an interesting experience. Uh, to grieve and to lead at the same time and to try to remember which hat I had on at which time. Uh, but thank you uh, for that. And uh, um, it was time for my mom uh, after all the years of Alzheimer's. And I ended the service with the Martin Luther King quote, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, she's free at last. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your prayers and, and your support. And, and Kevin, thank you for uh, stepping in and preaching your sermon instead of me preaching your sermon last week. So thank you. <laughs> I also ask for your prayers. Um, a few weeks ago, as you know, they found that I had a heart. <laughs> Much to the surprise of some. Um, and they fixed it. Uh, now they're going to work on other parts of my body. And so I'm having knee surgery this Wednesday. Um, and so I ask for your prayers as I go in for that surgery that it'll be successful and deal with the issue. And I won't have to go on to more dramatic kinds of surgery. And so uh, that's this Wednesday. So uh, I appreciate your prayers. And now Kevin has some information about the life and work of our church. Connection makes community happen, and we encourage you each Sunday to complete a connection card. Let us know that you worship with us. You can let us know of any um, changes to your information, your phone number, your email. And if you're a first-time visitor, it's an easy way for you to get added to our newsletter to keep you abreast of all of the important things that are happening in the life of our community. On the back of the connection card, you'll find a place for your comments and prayer requests. Our deacons do pray those prayers throughout the week. Each week, we also celebrate um, a group or individuals who are helping to make community happen. And this week, we ask that you celebrate the ministry of our deacons. <laughs> our deacons are headed by Kevin Wilcock, and they provide pastoral care to our community during our worship services, after our worship services. They hang around to pray with individuals or answer any of your questions and throughout the week they answer prayer requests phone calls and emails not just from people who come here to worship but literally emails from people around the world and so we ask that you hold them in your prayers if you want to get in touch with a deacon there's information in your worship bulletin and your newsletter about that 
Also, I would like to remind you that tomorrow is the last day that you can turn in paperwork if you are interested in joining this incredible movement as a member next Sunday. So you can bring your paper if you brought it with you, um, or we can give you new copies. Stop by the connection room immediately following worship service or the information desk, or you can contact the church office tomorrow to arrange to deliver that paperwork. I now invite you as you're able to rise and to greet those who are near you and extend the hand of friendship. God gives us the waters of new life. To give us hope when our lives run dry. To give us strength when the world seems harsh. God gives us the waters of new life. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a living stream.
we gather here this morning to hear your word, to help us deal with the pressure of the past week, to reassure us that you are with us no matter where we are. Fill our hearts with your love as we start another week. We ask this in your many names. Amen. Amen. <coughs> During the prayers of the people, we pray for others. And you are invited to name people or circumstances as prayer requests out aloud. Let us pray. Gracious God, your abundance surrounds us and sustains us. We thank you for gifts of friendship and new beginnings, for life as it unfolds and new opportunities for growth. God of grace, spirit of hope in our lives and in our world, there are many troubled by concerns. Some face the uncertainty and pain of illness. Some wrestle with anxiety and fear. 
about work, about relationships, and indeed about themselves. We pray that your healing love may touch these lives. Those affected by mental illness, those who are waiting test results, those who are discouraged about life. God of hope, spirit of compassion, be with us as we face losses in our lives. Where there is disappointment, lead us to joy. Where there is grief, fill us with your peace. Where there is death, help us to say goodbye for now, but not forever. Pray for the family of Cheryl Meyer and Joe Bell, the passing of Cheryl's mom. God of compassion. Breath of the universe, you have created us for joy. Open our minds to the gracious promptings of your spirit. Increase our trust and guide our hearts in the ways of the truth. God of many names, you transform us by grace and renew us in peace. Madeleine Langle was an American writer best known for young adult fiction and whose works reflect both her Christian faith and her strong interest in modern science. She wrote, life with its rules, its obligations, and its freedoms is like a sonnet. You're given the form, but you have to write the sonnet yourself. and teachers of religious law now arrived into Jerusalem to see Jesus. They asked him, Why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commandments of God? You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce. For they teach ideas made by people as commands from God. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come in nearby. And he said, Listen and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. Then the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Do you not realize that you have offended the Pharisees by what you have just said? These are sacred readings. May they comfort us, inspire us, and challenge us. Thanks be to God.
today we continue in our sermon series about the scandalous Jesus. We take a look at what was it about Jesus that upset so many people? What was it that actually led to them taking his life? You know, the Christian church has been said has domesticated Jesus. We spend a lot of time with the baby Jesus and time mourning his death, and we kind of ignore in between. And so this sermon series is about what happened in between that so upset the fundamentalists and the, and the political leaders of his day. And for those of us who are attracted to this Jesus, who think that his life is worth following, that his teachings are worth paying attention to, what did he do that so upset people, and what does that say to us as his followers? The gospel reading this morning is an amazing reading. It was obvious that Jesus broke a bunch of the rules and that his followers broke a bunch of the rules. And in this reading, Jesus really got upset. He got upset with the, the religious leaders who had all of these rules and regulations and were pretending that these rules and relation, regulations were from God. And Jesus points out the difference between laws made by people, even in the name of God, and laws made by God. And so much confusion that exists today exists because people in religious circles fail to make the difference and to see clearly what the rules are that they've made up and what the ones are that come from God. And it is very dangerous when religious leaders and religious institutions say that they speak for God and that they want then to set rules for everyone else. Now, I think there are some laws from God that are clear. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The Ten Commandments give us a hint about what those early people of faith thought some of the rules were. But so much of what religious institutions proclaim as rules or laws or traditions are not really of God, but of them. Now, some of us who happen to be LGBT can know the obvious example in our own community, where the church taught, the state, uh, legal, uh, the state outlawed behavior that we felt was of God. Women know in society and in the church how laws and traditions have relegated them to second-class status in many countries and in many faith traditions. And in terms of racial equality, the Christian church in the southern U.S. and in South Africa were the main supporters of apartheid, a law made by humans, not God. The church has often been the place of inequality and not quality. Equality. Not quality either, but equality either. <laughs> I made that slip at 9 o'clock this morning. It must, there must be a sermon there, but for another time. <laughs> the most segregated hour in all of North America is Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. So many different religions claiming that they have the voice of God, that it's their way as the only way and the only truth. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Why is it the church gets in the way? of that abundant life. Now, just in case you think I'm being hard on religion, officially atheist states or secular countries have also been places where equality has not exactly been proclaimed or practiced either. So this morning I want to address a practical issue. I've been asked so many questions about the Quebec Charter and what are my thoughts and feelings about it. I want to begin um, by saying I absolutely question the reasons why it was introduced at this time and the way that it was introduced as a political ploy, probably. But I also want to say that I support the concept of a secular state. And so therefore, I would remove crucifixes from all legislative buildings. I would not have one religious symbol predominate over other religious symbols in the public sphere. And I think the state should not be taking sides in promoting one religion, even if that religion is a historical one. That we should be living our values of compassion and forgiveness and justice. And Jesus condemned people who wanted to 
put their religious values in front of everybody without living them. I don't want judges or police officers to be biased in favor of or against any one particular religion. And I think all citizens should feel comfortable and safe going for, in front of any civic authority, any officer of the state. They should feel comfortable going in front of that person. On the other hand, how do we accomplish a fair and just and secular society while at the same time balancing freedom of religion? Now here's where I get myself into a little hot water and at one point almost gave our lawyer a heart attack when I was on a panel. Because I said on the panel, I did not support freedom of religion in human rights codes. And I think freedom of religion should be taken out of human rights codes. And I said that because historically, human rights codes had freedom to worship in the human rights codes, not freedom of religion. And freedom of worship meaning that the state could not interfere with the right of a person to worship in their tradition. But over time, with religious holidays and other issues, freedom of worship has gradually evolved into freedom of religion without any definition. And so all kinds of things now are being raised in the name of freedom of religion. Some of those are personal preferences, some of those are superstitions, and some of those have basis in uh, religion and religious teachings. So I think this is the kind of dilemma that Jesus was addressing when he said it's important to try to distinguish between human rules and God's rules and that rules need to be there to bring people into equality and justice, not to deny them the right for freedom. So people should be free to hold beliefs. People should be free to worship in their tradition. You can believe anything that you want. But if your idea of living out your faith of putting your faith into practice involves things that inhibit the freedoms of others. Clearly, we would condemn human sacrifice, which was once a religious tradition, or animal sacrifice, which is, in some cases, still a religious tradition. And the state should place appropriate restrictions on those. You may not want to work on Sunday, but you should not, by law, try to inhibit other people who want to practice their religion on another day and work on Sunday. So if that's confused you about where I stand on the charter, that's okay because I am confused. Uh, I understand part of the value of a secular state and, and the equality of gender issues, absolutely, uh, and that freedom of religion undefined should not undermine those. And how do you practice that? Well, supporting and trying to do the Canadian thing, which is to accommodate people and their differences as much as possible. Society has rules, and part of our faith tells us to be good citizens. Rules like don't speed, don't drive under the influence. These are good, real, good rules for society. Good rules for mayors. <laughs> good rules for uh, singers from Stratford, Ontario. <laughs> These are rules that we should obey. However, this does not mean, as we follow society's rules, that we should abdicate our values to society's values. Some rules were meant to be broken. Some rules were meant to be resisted. For example, when the Criminal Code of Canada was changed in the late 60s, and it was no longer illegal for same-sex sexual behavior, before that law was changed, I broke it every chance I got and was pleased to do so. <laughs> When society make laws, makes laws that inhibit equality, then frankly those laws should be broken or changed. And civil disobedience has been a just tool used by many faith communities down through the centuries to, appro to oppose unjust laws. And in the early days of MCC, there were clearly some laws that we could all rally around together that we thought were unjust. And so we picketed, we marched, we signed petitions, um, good friends Olivia and Jack, whenever uh, they needed to rally people to call politicians to protest or to sign petitions, would always call MCC because they knew we'd announce it on Sunday and by Monday the phones would be ringing off the hook. We have had a history of practicing civil disobedience, of practicing involvement in the political realm. 
And we need to make sure that just because some threats are gone, that we don't forget there is still a lot of need to challenge injustice. So besides society's rules, we also have religious-based rules. And my definition of religion is this. Practicing spirituality within community and having meaningful traditions. And so, yes, sometimes communities need to make rules and religious communities need to make rules. For instance, in our church, we generally don't interrupt sermons. You may fall asleep during them, but generally we don't interrupt them. However, I think religious communities need to be very, very careful when they make rules. For instance, this is what Jesus was challenging the leaders of his day about. They had a rule about ceremonial washing of hands before they ate. But Jesus' followers paid no attention to it. There were religious rules about when men could talk to women. But Jesus paid no attention to it. And Jesus scandalized people by breaking these rules that everyone took for granted. Today, various religions have their rules. And sometimes those rules need to be challenged. But we need to be very clear that when we're opposing a particular rule, we need to make sure that we're not giving the impression that we're condemning a whole faith tradition. So while you may oppose Sharia law, you should not be, re be doing so in a way that gives any kind of impression that you're against Islam. And while you may uh, support, uh, may attack uh, a particular law that is evident in our society, again, being careful that you're not attacking a particular faith tradition. It is fundamentalism that deserves to be challenged, not the world's major religions. And so we're particularly mindful of the damage that fundamentalist Christianity has done this week in the passing the death of Fred Phelps. The Reverend Nancy Wilson, head of our denomination, wrote this. We do not celebrate the, coming, the, the death of Fred Phelps. We have lived under the shadow of his hateful messages, and we will not follow in his footsteps. Today we pray for his soul and for his whole family. And Dina pasted this on, posted this on her Facebook. I disagree with all the folks who want him to rot in hell. I want him to discover when he draws his last breath on earth and breathes in his first breath of celestial air that he was sadly wrong about God all along and that God's love is for all of us unconditionally and passionately and eternally. That's what I want for him and for all of us. And this week as I was contemplating his death, I was imagining some of the conversations that he's now having with people whose funerals he picketed. Was Matthew Shepard there to greet him? I believe a God of unconditional love will welcome Fred Phelps into whatever heaven or afterlife you think is real or imaginary or metaphor. And I can see Matthew Shepard greeting Fred Phelps, putting his arm around him and saying, okay, now let's talk. And preparing him for God's conversation with him. The bottom line is we are called to be good citizens, but not violating our values. And the law of God says to us that compassion and love and forgiveness, honoring the differences of others, have to be a basis for our actions. Jesus broke rules and traditions which were getting in the way of people experiencing abundant life, getting in the way of people experiencing God's love. Jesus spent a whole lot of time defying expectations, ruffling feathers, getting in trouble, breaking the rules. He broke the rules of gender norms. He touched the unclean. He made the first last and the last first. He healed dying children and bleeding women when they said stay away. He cured people of diseases of the body, mind, heart, and spirit when they said it was the wrong day of the week. He blessed the poor. He freed the captives. He broke traditional religious rules by how he fed people who were hungry emotionally and spiritually. He asked questions. He engaged others on the journey. And he humbly broke the rules for one reason only, to share God's love and to bring justice to others. So this is the kind of rule breaking that challenges us, his followers, challenges us to take on the injustices 
of our day. The kind of rule breaking that caused a black woman who was tired and refused to give up her seat in Montgomery, Alabama. The kind of rule breaking that caused a church in Toronto to perform the first gay and lesbian weddings, to put on a bulletproof vest in order to take on an injustice. The kind of rule breaking that causes young people in Jamaica and Russia to reach out to MCC to say, we want to start a church in our countries even though we will be at risk, to reach out to our denomination, to join with us, to stand up for people, to march for people, to challenge the rules, to break the rules, and to challenge religions who preach tolerance for murder of people who are different. This May, I'm going to an LGBT Christian conference in Estonia to meet with folks who are on the front lines in many of those countries, whose lives are at risk simply by gathering together. And I'm meeting with them to talk about how can we help? What can we do to help? John is not pleased that I'm going. Uh, he's nervous, so pray for him and me uh, while I'm away. But I do think it's crucially important that we be there with those folks who are on the front lines. So in conclusion, Jesus broke the rules and caused a scandal. And Jesus means for those who follow him to break the rules, to challenge laws. Wherever there is injustice, wherever a rule or a law prevents someone from their full potential, that we are to challenge those laws. Yes, may we celebrate the birth of Jesus, and may we mourn his death, but surely it's time for us to pay attention to what happened in between. Amen. The same scandalous Jesus of justice showed us a revolutionary way to a relationship with God, freeing us from whatever hinders us, reconciling us with a loving, caring God, with each other, and with ourselves. Now we pray. God, we recognize those times when we have separated ourselves from you and each other we have not always cared for, respected, and loved our world, our neighbor, or ourselves. We have sinned by things we have done and by things we have left undone. We open our hearts again to the renewal, the forgiveness, and the freedom you are. Hear this amazing, liberating news. God reminding us, behold, I make all things new. In every moment know that you are loved and therefore you are forgiven, free. Free in the name of God who created and recreates you. God who dwells within you and God who is with you always. Amen. Please feel free to come forward to receive anointing for healing for yourself or for someone else.
MCC Toronto is part of an international denomination of metropolitan community churches. In about 170 countries around, 170 churches in 28, 29 countries around the world and many other uh, countries uh, exploring joining our denomination. And as part of that denomination, every Sunday when you put money in the offering plate or through the other ways that you give, 10% of all of that goes to that denomination. And they use it to expand work around the world and to support people uh, in small, large, and newly forming churches. And a part of the process of any denomination is uh, having a way to call forward and train new clergy. People who will serve on the staff of churches or who will head up churches. Um, and we are part of that, uh, that trend. And today, uh, we're going to be doing a blessing for Bruce Lee, who will be taking the next step on his journey uh, towards eventual ordination in our denomination. Many of you know Bruce. You've seen him around. You've seen him at the front of the church. You've seen him in different ways uh, in our church over the years. And today represents a circling back for Bruce. When he was 14 years old, he received his call to ministry. And Bruce is, Bruce is uh, very well organized. And so this, the next step and the next step that needs to be in place to follow that call were followed, including going to seminary. And while he was at a very conservative, um, I guess we could say that's fair, uh, seminary, he came out. And uh, that was a few years back and was not exactly greeted with open arms, but it became an increasingly difficult place to be. He persisted and got his degree, uh, but the church that he was serving uh, made it known they didn't want him on staff any longer uh, for that church. And so Bruce came to Toronto years ago, and he started attending, attending MCC Toronto 22 years ago. And after hearing Bruce's story, I immediately began the conversation, well, when are you going to go back to your call again? And... Uh, Bruce uh, said, when I'm ready, but it's not time yet. And I just want to celebrate Bruce's willingness to trust the institutional church again, because we're a part of that institutional church. And so today he is saying yes to God and, willing, and his willingness uh, to re-engage that call that happened when he was 14 years old. And so now Kevin is going to introduce you a bit to the process. So the clergy internship is roughly one year, and it is a way for us as a community to work with Bruce in order to prepare him for whatever his call may be once he completes that process. It may take a village to raise a child. It takes a community to prepare new clergy people. As part of that process, we invite you and encourage you to observe Bruce as he's working in the life of the congregation. He is going to be participating in many different aspects so that he has a very full experience, experience all the, all the different ways um, that we do ministry, some of the things that are behind the scenes, some of the things in worship as you've already seen him. And most specifically, um, he's also helping us to organize our peace and justice ministry such that beyond the social justice network and the refugee ministry that we already have, um, he will be working with you in order to find people who have similar passions to make it easy for you to identify one another and to get together so that we can actually be doing a lot more ministry in our community, city, and world. So if, if you've got a passion for hunger action or homelessness or something else, let Bruce know what's on your heart and let's see how we can do that ministry together. In addition to this community, um, Jo Bell, who is unfortunately not here today, but promised that she is watching us online. Jo Bell is going to be uh, the student clergy supervisor. Bruce is meeting with Jo regularly um, throughout this process. And in addition, there are six individuals from the congregation who sit on a committee to guide Bruce and be with Bruce and pray with Bruce as he goes through this process. And they are Cheryl Lalonde, Randy Williams, Sue Ellis, Leah Morin, Mike Dodds, and Carolyn O'Reilly. They will work together. And so if you have feedback for Bruce, we encourage you to share that with Bruce. If you've observed Bruce doing incredible things, we also encourage you to contact Joe or any of the members of Bruce's committee so that when he is finished, 
he will be the best possible clergy person that this congregation could possibly produce. I now invite um, the members of his committee, as well as Mark, his partner, to come forward as we have a brief, brief blessing. And Shelley Morris, our executive director, I invite you to come down as well. If you feel comfortable and you want to reach towards Bruce as we pray together, please do so. God, we thank you for your call on our lives. We thank you for the many, many different ways that all of us can serve you in many different capacities. And in particular this day, we thank you for your call on Bruce's life. We thank you that he heard it when he was 14 and that he began that process. And we thank you that he is willing to hear it again and to say yes again and to trust again. And God, we ask your blessing on him in the coming months that these may be wonderful times of learning and growing and experiencing new things. We ask your blessing as he prepares to take the next step on his journey. And God, we thank you for Mark and for his love for Bruce and for his willingness to enter into this process together with Bruce. God, we thank you that you don't give up on us even when it's very tempting to give up on your church. We ask now your blessing. In your many names we pray. Amen. Amen. Could you welcome Bruce on the next step of his journey? So in a few moments, you will have an opportunity to participate in this denomination, uh, this international movement through the giving of your offerings. But in the meantime, we have a musical offering.
Let us pray. God, we offer you these gifts out of our abundance to your work in this community and from this community. Your love frees us to be generous with each other and inspires us to action as we build bridges in this place and from this place to a world hungry for hope, for justice, and for peace. And so we commission these gifts to your service in the world. Amen. Amen. God is with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our God. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, loving God, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with all the company of heaven who forever sing to proclaim the glory of your name. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. These are the gifts of God, and we are the people of God. All are welcome to come and receive.
Imagine a community supporting the needs of families who wish to ground their children in a spirituality that celebrates love and honors diversity. Our number one priority this past year has been our children's ministry. We're attracting more parents and children to our Sunday school program, and we make sure that the children are consistently a part of our 11 a.m. service. Our children's choir performs once a month to everyone's delight. In the coming year, we want to expand this ministry to support the spiritual and social needs of diverse families and youth. MCC Toronto is now one of the very few places people can go if they want their children raised in a faith community that's vibrant, inclusive and progressive. Imagine a community sheltering courageous refugees who flee their homelands in fear of violence directed at them for living authentically as who they are. MCC Toronto's unique refugee program provides a bridge to hope, safety, freedom and wholeness for lesbian, gay, bi and transgendered refugees who fear or have experienced persecution, torture or grave danger in their home countries. This past year we've sponsored five refugees from the Middle East and Africa and we've been busy helping them get settled into their new homes, school and work. We've distributed nearly $10,000 worth of donated clothing, including winterwear for the many refugees who come from places that are lots warmer than Canada. And we're proud to offer them a warm welcome here. Imagine a safe space for LGBT teenagers to learn and pursue their education free from homophobia and bullying. The Triangle Programme, a partnership between MCC Toronto and the Toronto District School Board, offers a haven for at-risk youth from Ontario and all over Canada so they can finish school. It's the only such program in Canada and the first in North America. And MCC Toronto has provided space and covered infrastructure costs for 18 years, in which nearly 600 teens have been helped. These kids learn more than schoolwork. They learn that someone believes in them and that they can believe in themselves. For the past five years, we've been webcasting MCC Toronto's Sunday morning services. When we started doing this, we had no idea how it would take off. We now have viewers from nearly 120 countries, and over the course of a year, over 10,000 people will watch one of our webcasts. Our goal in the coming year is to continue to improve the quality, professionalism and reach of our webcasts, to translate our services into multiple languages and to find ways to increase the visibility and reach of this vital ministry. We want more and more people around the world to know a spiritual home that celebrates global diversity, works towards social justice and proclaims God's unconditional love for all. I reach for your outstretched hand
Whatever injustice you see this week, know that God calls you to follow in the one who would stand up against it, to speak out against it. Know that God calls you to, to stand up against any form of equality that you see around you. And as you do that, know that God's blessings go before you, that God's face will shine upon you and be gracious unto you, and God will grant you peace. You're going out and in your coming in. You're lying down and in your rising up in your labor, in your leisure, in your laughter, and in your tears until that day in which there is no dawning and no sunset, no death, and no disease. Go now rejoicing that God loves you. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. Please join us for refreshments in the social hall through either of these four doors directly behind me. The slide will tell you a few of the things that are happening during that time. The room we're going to name, we need your suggestions, and you can do so until Thursday. You can see Sunday News or E-News to tell you how to do that, or there's hard copies of the survey in the social hall. Next Sunday is the fifth Sunday of the month, and whenever that happens, we have a food drive, and so we're asking you to bring non-perishable food items Please don't just drop them off at the back of the church when you come next Sunday. Keep them with you, and when they bring the offering down to the front, you bring your gifts down to the front and gather with those here as we commission them. They will be given to the Toronto People with AIDS Foundation uh, for their support for people who don't have enough food. And um, if you are concerned about the issue of hunger and you want to help, one of the ways you could do is to volunteer to be a part of our uh, Foods for Friends uh, every time there's a fifth Sunday of the month and to help to facilitate that. And if you're interested, write it on your connection card next week or see Kevin or Bruce after the service and we'll make you a part of that. After every 11 o'clock service, in the, the first room here on your right, um, one of our deacons and Leanne Horvath, uh, will be, one of our staff, will be there uh, for about 15 minutes following the service for any first-time visitors to drop in or anybody needing to connect. Uh, they will be around. Next Sunday, as we continue our sermon series, the teaser question is this. Are you willing to follow a rabble-rouser to find love and justice? And we're talking about Jesus. Okay? You know, I don't want to sound trite. I've been, both of the services today, have been just so full of memories of my mom and, and stuff and just wanted to talk to, about her, but it wasn't appropriate for today and Maybe next Sunday I'll talk a little bit more, but, you know, Mom died a few days before Fred Phelps, and Mom was always one to tackle referees. She felt that none of her kids ever committed a foul in any sport they ever played in. It was <laughs> always the referee's fault. And so, uh, you know, Mom arriving in heaven a few days before Phelps gave her a chance to smooth off some of her rough edges, so she didn't, because <laughs> the first homicide in heaven would have happened. <laughs> You know, when he showed up, so, uh, you know. Let's join together and sing our closing song. <laughs>